Hey, welcome to Mario Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And I'm Derek. Woo! We have uh, Derek Cassio on the podcast today. Welcome. Hey, yes. guys. Thanks Heir to me. the Cassio fortune. That's true. We always say one more letter and a lot less money because we used to get that all the time. <laughs> so, uh, it has followed me around. Well, thanks for having me, guys. This yes. is really exciting. We are excited to have you here. We met, I think we both met Derek at the same time, if I'm not mistaken, at the Square One conference. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. you were a you, you were a speaker there, or yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, I did one of the uh, one of the presentations there, and um, you know, I was familiar with both your guys' work online, and uh, it was funny because I also draw on receipts. I was, I didn't want to say anything, <laughs> but I had to bring it up, um, and I've got a funny story about that later. But uh, but no, I, I was familiar familiar with your work, and and it was really exciting to get a chance to. Uh, to meet you guys, I was actually in the same apartment yeah. suite with James, so we, we kind of got to talking there. Oh, you guys, you guys, we were <laughs> bunked up bunk, together, yeah. bunk beds. We were actually, it was cousins. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Bunk. <laughs> Arrested Development. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we um, and then the last day of the well, the day after the conference ended, we we spent a couple hours in a Starbucks together, yeah. just chatting. And I ended up getting stranded in uh, Chicago. And I think Derek's last words to me were, see you later, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get home. And then I ran away. Uh, so, so, Derek, we're so uh, thankful to have you on the podcast today. Um, you know, Derek, for those of you who aren't familiar, is uh, assistant professor at Wentworth yep, uh, Institute. Yep, at uh, Wentworth the Institute of Technology in Boston, Massachusetts. And you've had a wide range of other experiences, like uh, co-founder of the Design Museum Boston, or yep. Fourth Law Labs yep. co-founder. Um, you've worked at Marvel, Phillips, Staples. So w- we brought you in to hear your story and have your uh, advice be shared. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, a little background on me. So uh, one quick correction. It was Hasbro, but on the Marvel team. And we'll talk about oh. that in a second. Cool. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Which was a... Very weird experience. It was awesome, but very strange. So, uh, so how did I get here? Uh, it's been a really weird, windy road. Right. Um, I started. You know, all of this goes back to you know 1982 and Transformers. Really mm. it has a lot to do. Like He Man and Transformers, very formative as to yeah. how I became a designer. Although for the longest time, I thought I was going to be a pharmacist because everybody in my family is a pharmacist. We owned a pharmacy ah. for 52 years. Um, Grew up in, a, in, both my parents had independent businesses, so it was very much like you work and you eat because you worked. You know, there was mm. a lot of that growing up, mm. and, you know, I went to work with my mom, and, and, you know, there was a lot of that growing up. My mom used to, went to college for uh, graphic design, but left that. So we had some of that creativity in the family. Um, when I graduated high school, I saw uh, Toy Story when I was like in eighth grade, mm. and, I, and I had no, I did not have a lot of artistic talent. I did a little bit of drawing and stuff, but it wasn't until the very end of high school where that really... Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My first art class was my junior year of high school, and I did one painting, yeah. and I was like, ooh, this is, hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I used to draw comic book characters and stuff all the time because I was a big comic book nerd. Yeah. And, um, and you know, didn't really do anything with that. I didn't know how you got better. Yeah. Number one, I was like, this is how you do it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I, I got to high school and left a class and went into an art class. And I said, oh, I kind of got a knack for this. And um, I saw Toy Story and I was like, that's what I want to do. So I went to RIT for film and animation and uh, oh. for a year and a half. And that was an integral part of my life because I met a lot of people there that have since influenced my, my life and my career. Wow. And it's really all about that, right? So much of this yeah. is about connecting with people and who you know and building those relationships and right. that's how you not only get better at what you do but also how you open doors and and help others and that kind of thing yeah um, and so much of that path was really dictated by my mom growing up because she was into all that stuff mm. that got me interested in design so she brought transformers to me and was like these are super cool i wish i had these really when I was a kid. oh yeah <laughs> my mom's awesome and uh you so know, hip. It, it, it Starcom and Silverhawks and Thundercats and all these things that were like adventure based. And yeah. so a lot of my childhood was was rooted in Transformer. This fantastical world of of good versus evil and heroes and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And um and so went to RIT, did not love the program, right? Which is another great lesson if you're in school and you're not loving the thing, don't stay there. <laughs> like, right. You know, I was there for a year and a half. I left. Um, didn't know what I was going to do. I really liked, you know, film and animation. I thought I'll go to Ringling or, or, you know, my dad said no, cause it's crazy expensive at the time. Mm. And, um, you know, it was not an easy decision to leave, but it was the right one. 
And so came home, worked full time at the pharmacy for nine months, which was actually probably another major like life thing. You know, when yeah. you work in the healthcare industry in particular and you meet a lot of sick people or you meet people who are in these like the worst positions that they've ever been in. And, you know, I watched how my dad interact with them and I worked with both sides of my family work there. Pretty much everybody yeah. at some point in my life had worked at this store. Um, so I was working there for full time and going to school uh, online early days of online education, by the way, not great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that is a story for another time, but, um, you know, doing all this stuff, juggling all these things and trying to figure out what I was going to do. Yeah. And I got the art of episode one star Wars book, which is a, you hear the story from a lot of designers that are kind of around my age or something. They, they got this book and I opened this and I said, what is, how are they getting these gradients like what are they using for this stuff yeah. no idea what any of this is it, and it's just chock full of all the concept art from oh yeah from the yeah movies. and i was like this is a thing like you can do concept art and, and what do these guys do and i found conceptart.org and and you know said oh i want to be a concept artist oh, and uh okay. because it was film and animation and this right. is where, for, forget right. the animation this comes before the animation right right and these guys have some you know background in industrial design huh what the heck is that and so I started, you know, early days of search engines. I went to Ask Jeeves, and I asked him, what is industrial design? And <laughs> I, I uh, even, remember that? I, I don't even know what Ask Jeeves you know is. Oh, wow. Sorry, he was a digital butler that would tell you things. Yeah. It was like, it's essentially Google. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But it had, yeah, yeah it had a uh, butler mascot. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Jeeves. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm dating myself. But, uh, you know, there was no Core 77, really. You know, this is, this is before all that stuff. And uh, what time? What year was this? This was two thousand and two. Okay. Um, and so wow, it feels like a long time ago. And um, it came up with Massachusetts College of Art and Design at the time. It was just called Massachusetts College of Art. Excuse me. And um, turns out my uncle had graduated from there in like nineteen seventy six. Uh-huh. And he said, "Oh yeah, you should check that place out. Well, it's a state school, so the tuition was excellent. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was closer to home and." And I was older now, and I said, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I had my portfolio from that I built at RIT, and I submitted it, and I got in. And uh, and that really started the the college thing What did me. your portfolio look like from RIT? All fine arts. Yeah. It was all fine art. Okay. Um, it was a couple of some renderings and things that I had done in my 3D modeling classes mm. that were character design stuff and sets and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of figure drawing, like cool. a lot of figure drawing. For mass art, that was great. Yeah. Um, so I got in. Did, did four years of design there, um, came into that with a very different perspective on like, I got the college thing out of my system very quickly. And I was like, this is, this is work. Mm, this right. is my job. Mm-hmm. I'm going to treat this like a job and I'm going to go in and I'm going to push myself as hard as I can. And I have a tendency to take on more than I probably should. Mm. But, um, so I double majored. I was also working full time while I was there. Um, what would you? What was your majors in? So illustration and industrial design. Okay. I dropped the illustration actually second first first or second semester of my senior year. Mm. Uh, we can get into that later as to why, but it ties into a lot of other stuff. Um, and uh, I was running IDSA Boston with uh, with Sam Aquilano, who would go on to found the des- design museum with me, uh, and two other friends of ours, and we were doing that. Uh, at the same time, I was in school and working as an assistant property manager for my dorm, the company that ran my dorm, and a janitor and I had a whole bunch of other jobs (laughs) and uh you know I had relationships at the time too and it was just juggling all of this stuff and for me you know that's how I kept pushing was oh I wonder how much more I can take on before I like shatter into a million pieces (laughs) I think it's a good I think it's a good thing to do is kind of push yourself right Right. find your limits yeah Yeah. because you have to kind of know and you'd be shocked at how far they actually are right especially if you're smart about how you like all of these things you know I'm really big on overlapping opportunities Mm. so all of these things fed each other Right. right. The IDSA stuff fed my professional work and got me in contact with people. And, you know, my, my job at the the dorm, you know, opened up all of my avenues in the school. So it made getting my classes and stuff easier. And, oh, you know, some students good. would that's have a good. hard time. Like, oh, I don't know who to talk to. I knew everybody. And mm. that has really been sort of the linchpin, you know, the networking side of that. For me, that was my strength in school. I was not the best designer in school hmm. by a long shot, hmm. but I could present very well. And I knew everybody. <laughs> and so that that really, you know, yeah. you got to kind of find your strengths. Well, there, and it right? seems like you're fairly tenacious. Like, yeah. You Sometimes know. you don't even realize you're doing it, too. You're just like, i got to get this stuff done. And then you realize <laughs> that you're, you're running around and somebody's like, this guy's crazy. What is he? <laughs> and you just, you just, you're just doing it. And, yeah. then, and then you look back on it and you go, what? That was 
wow, that was a lot of stuff. But you're already in seven other things, yeah. so you don't really think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you fun. think you have a hard time saying no in general? Yes. <laughs> except for uh, this except for, um no I, I do i've gotten much better at that over yeah. the years i think partially because you you kind of learn what you're fo- what you want to focus on right and, but even then you know i find myself in freelance projects from time to time and like why did i do this yeah yeah uh, that, ha- that, that happens feeling. to all of us yeah, <laughs> yeah. Happens yeah. To all of us um and my wife is also a designer she's a graphic designer so that cool. that is that feeds you kind of feed each other into that stuff right and, and uh when everybody's you got to take time to not do work all the time yeah and you know, we try to remind each other to do that. From yeah. That's good. Time. That's good. Um, Take breaks. Yeah. So, uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. So first, <laughs> I know, I'm very cognizant of the time. It's um, okay. So ended up coming out of school, uh, made some connections through IDSA, got my first job. I had an internship when I was, we don't, mass art was, we did not have an intern program or anything like that. You kind of did it on your own. Yeah. Or if mm-hmm. one of your upperclassmen, friends knew something, they'd get you in. So I had enough transfer credits from RIT that I was actually, I could have graduated when I was a junior. I just mm. didn't have all of my classes. So I had a lot of free time my senior year. So I took an internship. Um, that was a couple days a week. And uh, and what was that? That was uh, industrial design um, at a firm called Proteus, which is now Motive. Hmm. Um, okay. And I, I learned a lot while I was there. Um, and I hustled. And I didn't have a lot of access to actually doing design work, but I was around professional designers. I got right. to see a lot of it firsthand. Um, but, you know, I, I, didn't, I still didn't really know what design was. Yeah. You know, and I, I see this a lot with my own students too, but, you know, like what am I supposed to be doing here? I've got, I've got my review and I've got, okay, I've got the board with the exploded view and I've got the board that has inspiration images on it, I guess. I don't know what that means. <laughs> and I've got some terrible drawings. And, and I just had these discrete elements and I didn't understand how it all connected. And it yeah. wasn't until I was a senior where um, in my junior year, we had a, a new head of our department came in. And, and uh, one of the things he said right, early, right at the beginning was, you know, you're trying to tell a story with this. Right. And that was when it clicked for me. And I said, oh, like a movie. Oh, mm. I did film an animation. Right. And you know, I love yeah. it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I can do this. And yeah. that changed everything. And that, that changed the way I presented and that changed the way I was thinking about my work and why I was making stuff. And I looked at those things less like individual objects and more like these props I was designing for the movie that I was making about these people that I learned about and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, for me, cool. movies and that analogy of, of movies plays a, a large role in how I tackle design, but also how I structure portfolios or tell my students to structure portfolios. And mm. it turns out a story is a story is a story, right. right? Like that structure, that three act structure works for everything <laughs> mm. uh, largely, right? There's always exceptions, but yeah. um, music's another great parallel for mm. design. So oftentimes there's a way to find a creative outlet that mirrors what we do and sometimes you know with regards to my students they have backgrounds and some of that stuff so you can make those connections at any rate got my first job uh after doing some contract work for proteus um and i I got a phone call and in the same day and i was in new york which is crazy i was walking down uh i got a phone call from uh herbs lazar bell which was a industrial design firm that's i don't i don't really think they're around anymore um they said, I asked me if I wanted to get a two month contract gig. And then I got another phone call the same day from a company that I had interviewed with saying, we want you to start. And it was two months later. So I was, I got two jobs in the same day. Oh, wow. And I was, I, I was so excited. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I said yes to both of them clearly. And, um, that, that was the beginning of my, my industrial design, um, professional industrial design career. Yeah. And so Color Kinetics was the company, um, in Boston was a brand like fairly new LED lighting startup. They they own the patent on color changing LED lights. Mm. So what that means is that if you wanted to use any LEDs that change color, you had to go through them. Mm. At the time, it, when they started, it was nothing. Like you, you could barely get any little light out of it. Well, they worked very very hard for a very long time to make it something that you could then light up. You know the Brooklyn Bridge with, or you know th- their fixtures are now lighting up massive installations all over the world yeah and so it was still color kinetics at the time i went in tom mall now who was an rit grad so that rit connection is still there hired me on saw something in my work i'm not sure what it was Um, (laughs) but we did have a a mutual love of the simpsons and that's actually one of the things that sealed the deal was he said something and i finished the quote oh and we were like we're gonna get along just fine (laughs) and uh and but you know he said my work the work that i had in school all looked like it could be made like it, it wasn't these wild conceptual things that they were seeing a lot of. And that was good for them because they were very much an engineering first 
kind of company. Like yeah. the stuff, it was function first, which was good because I'm pretty much a functionalist when it comes to design and, and it, it all kind of meshed. Turns out I didn't know anything about how stuff got made, right? Like I didn't know how to do <laughs> well, it. No one does when they No, make exactly. No. When you're yeah, right yeah. out of school. Yeah. And, um, and so I got in there and it was a crash course in engineering and, and it was great and the people were awesome and, and I learned a lot. About a year in, Phillips bought the company out and uh, things went real weird for a while. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, every the culture changed almost overnight. People were leaving and this was my first experience. Like, what is going on? Like, why is everybody angry? And That's kind of crazy. Huh. It was super first crazy. Job? Yeah, yeah, very, very crazy. And um, my stock was worth a little bit of money though. That was cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was nice. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, so I got a phone call from a classmate, and this is why staying in touch with your classmates is so important. And uh, he was working at Staples. Mm. And he said, listen, you know, I know things are kind of weird where you're at right now. And, and it was it was tough because I love Tom, and he taught me so much. I didn't really want to go anywhere. But uh, but he said, listen, we have this opportunity to – we have an open position now. Um, do you want to come in and interview? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, all right. I'll come in. I met with Michael Kent, who was the design director. He's, he's passed away uh, not too long ago, which was – which was tough, but um, I sat down with Michael and uh, my interview went something like this. Chad tells me you're the guy. Are you the guy? I said, yeah, I'm the guy. Okay, you can start Monday. <laughs> I went, what? That's it? That's that was interview? it. That was it. Oh, that's crazy. So I'm in there with my portfolio. I'm ready to go. Right. And, and you know, he'd already seen the stuff and knew the work was good. And, yeah. And uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to need a few weeks to do, to do this. Right. Uh, so I went to Staples. Left Color Kinetics, went to Staples, designed office supplies. I love office supplies. Back That's to school. Not, that sounds like a fun little gig. It was great. It was great. It was a crucible. It was so intense. It was my first experience with buyers. It was mm. my first experience with retail. Yeah. Oh, it, it, dog toys, right? I'm oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Retail in general. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was just the two of us. We were managing outside vendors we were both young designers Dang. michael was kind of steering the ship but we were doing a lot of the boots on the ground work um and we had to you know it was it was a crash course in like how do you stand up for your design mm. how do you prove that you know what you're talking about even if you don't know what you're talking about like how can you can you can you learn to be able to be confident about your stuff turns out you know that went okay um but we were there two in the morning Chad was sleeping over my house. We were getting up and going back into the office yeah. again. It Dang, was, that's crazy. We did. I, I, in one year, I touched 300 products. Oh, my gosh. 300. That's, that's an estimate. Well, I mean, is, yeah. that, is that from, from start to finish? Or no. is that like, no. like choosing? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Sourcing stuff. So it, yeah. was, it was everything with a Staples brick on it. Right. Staples own brand stuff. Yeah. We, we touched it. Yeah. So you think about how many products are in the aisle. Oh, yeah. Um, whether it was color spec, graphic right. design work, okay. putting okay. tech packs together for stuff all the way from the ground up, yeah. doing furniture, managing outside vendors who were doing work for you. So we did... That's like the whole nine yards. Like, that's everything. That's the whole it, process. Yeah. It was the whole... I mean, it was like working nine years at another company in one one place. Yeah. It was a great experience. Um, but after about a year of that, I was like, this is not sustainable. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Especially because I pushed myself pretty hard and wanted to do a great job. I got to go to China. I got to do all this wonderful stuff there. Right. Um, got a phone call from the guys at Color Kinetics. And they said, oh. hey, listen, things are cool. Like everything kind <laughs> of shook out. Settled. The dust is settled. Yeah. Uh, we really want you to come back. And, um, you know, at the same time, I was just like, oh, man, do I, do I want to do that? So I said, yeah, all right. Like. I'm going to come back. There was a pay increase and all that kind of great stuff. Yeah. Got to work with some of my friends again. Did that for a while there um, through ups and downs and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and it was around 2008 when we started the museum up. So that was happening at the same time. But now before... Yeah, please. Sorry. Bef- before the museum, yeah. what exactly did did you design at this Philips? Oh, sure. Course? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Was it a light bulb itself or was no, it... No, no. So we... Uh, LED, high-end architectural and residential LED lighting fixtures and okay. power supplies and all of the systems for control. So that okay. means keypads, controllers, um, you know, the light fixtures themselves, mm. uh, which are very industrial. They're pretty much just extremely well-designed heat sinks. Mm. Um, but that was awesome because it got, and you're talking about theatrical applications too. So I see. Okay. Um, LED, this was all sort of like, and they were the leader. Uh, Phillips was buying up people left and right. But um, I learned a ton doing yeah. that and you got to go and bring some of that design thinking and research to areas that had not seen it so you know we went to theatrical houses and we watched how they handled ellipsoidal fixtures and like 
they're tough with them, right? Mm. And they do things like spray paint stuff so they know which fixtures are which. Mm. And that in, uh, introduced all these cool insights into things hmm. that we could do. They ended up not moving forward with that product, but we put a ton of time into yeah. that. Hmm. Um, so, so that was that was really neat. Yeah, so what was like typical development timeline at a place like that? Probably about a year to two years, depending on what the yeah. what the product was. Some of them were, were faster, but usually it was about a year to two years. Yeah. So you're talking about, you know, initial concept like hey listen we've got this light engine that we want to use all this stuff sounds really cool too we've got this light engine it sounds light amazing <laughs> um and you know i learned a lot about power supplies and ele electrical uh, engineering you know i worked with optical engineers electrical engineers quality engineers mechanical engineers yeah uh, you name it um supply chain engineers the list goes applications engineers yeah those guys were our were our key into the the customer base yeah um my sister worked there too for a while which was kind of nuts so that was cool to be able to work you know, alongside, I, I didn't see her very often, but she was doing sort of the buying and management side of stuff, which oh, was marketing, interesting. which was interesting. Um, so that that was really awesome. Um, again, hardcore engineering experience. Right. Um, did you find yourself like after that really intense Staples job, mm -hmm. like did that, did that uh, change the way that you worked at all when you went back to Phillips? It's, it was a very different place because yeah. the timelines were so much longer. Um, it, Again, you know, when you when you go into the crucible and you mm -hmm. come out hardened, yeah, uh, and you are stronger than you were before, <laughs> you know, it, it allows you to say, "Oh, I'm actually capable." And this is like a recurring theme. I did this in school too, mm -hmm. but it, you come out of it and you go, oh, "I can actually take on a lot more than than right. I thought I could." So when I was working at at Phillips, you know, we're pushing the envelope, we're doing this stuff. I realized, like, oh, we can. You know, I was still doing stuff with IDSA Boston yeah. on the side too. Yeah, and said, "Oh, you know." I think we could do more than what we're doing with IDSA mm. and I, I can do the work that I'm doing at Phillips and I have this kind of window of time, not at work, but when I get home, I'm not working till two in the morning anymore. Yeah. Right? Oh, wow. That's crazy. I've got my <laughs> nights back again, you know? Yeah. And so, um, so my friend Sam and I sat down and we said, look, we want to bring design education to the public, right? We're talking, IDSA, we're talking a lot to uh, other designers, which is great. Mm -hmm. And, but we're kind of, saying the same thing over and over and over again. And we, we've got more design in Boston. It was like at the time in 2009, 2000, it was like 17% higher than the national average concentration of design in Boston, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. Okay. We have a ton across yeah. all the disciplines. Yeah. Right? Absolute ton. And so we said, nobody knows about this. And we're doing all this work. And the, the, the public, this is, these, the design process is one that can be applied to everything. Right. right. So this is something that, the public should know about like not only are these amazing things designed by people that are right in your backyard but it's a thriving economic component to massachusetts creative economy and uh you can do it too right and so yeah. so we said how are we going to do this well people learn at museums right like people go to museums the public goes to museums to learn about stuff yeah that's what we're thinking yeah so we'll just start a museum all right that's a, da <laughs> that's a daunting task yeah. um and uh and that was an unbelievably formative and incredible experience. I did that for four years while I was working full time and and uh, made the full time leap to the museum at, towards the end of it. Um, and I was also teaching mm. in that as well. Again, all overlapping opportunities though. These things fed each other yeah. in really exciting ways. And you guys, did you guys have a like a physical building for the museum and everything? That's a great question, Nick. Uh, so <laughs> it's like he's done this before. Um, so when we started, the very initial thought around Design Museum Boston. Sam and I were in his living room and we're like, design museum. That's what we want to do, right? Yeah, cool. Boston, there it is. Like that's the name. So what is it? It's a building. We'll do this building and it's going to be great. Well, it turns out in 2008, there was a massive economic collapse. Right. So raising capital funds for a museum is out of the question. Yeah. But as designers, we're trained to find opportunity, right? We, right. we look for problems and we try to find solutions. Well, there were a lot of empty retail spaces around. Mm. And we said, oh, Light bulb goes off. LED right. light bulb goes right. off. And we said, <laughs> that is where we can do the museum. We'll do it in the public spaces that aren't being utilized. It can draw traffic to these places again. And it's where people already are. And oh. Design Museum Boston was born. So we said, look, we'll, we'll do public design exhibitions. And we'll have events and programming and that kind of stuff um, around this. And we started talking about it. And we started. And that's how you get stuff started. I mean, mm -hmm. same thing with podcast. Well, we'll do a podcast. And you just start doing it, right? Yep. Yeah. We yep. didn't know anything about how to do any of this but we we were both extremely ambitious and 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 sam is unbelievably organized and 
you know, we were we were just starting to build this, and we had great support from you know Sam's brother and my now wife, and and uh, who both helped us lay the foundation for this thing, and we just started building those blocks up, and we got so good at at you know working together and understanding when we were talking to people like this is what they want, and we can shift like this, and maybe the museum needs to pivot and change a little bit more here that you know we'd be in meetings and pitches and talking about this and just be changing the vision for this museum like on the fly mm. and at the end of it you end up with this really wonderful like crystallized thesis of what the thing is and we started doing exhibitions we had our first exhibition at Reebok uh, and then we had our, our really first major exhibition was at Boston City Hall and it was up called Creative Capital mm. it was up for two years it was all about stuff that was designed in Boston that's awesome and uh, yeah it was really it, it's the story for that museum is, is so big. It's, it's called Design Museum Foundation now, and they actually have a branch in Portland, Oregon, and in San Francisco. So I left about four or five years in. Sam has gone on to continue building that. They have a staff now and, and everything. It's really been exciting to see. And uh, in, at, you said you mentioned at a certain point mm. you left Phillips to go full time at the museum. Yeah, yeah. So and so, that's kind of a daunting task as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean. Yes. <laughs> like, you, 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 they talk all the time in the startup world about making the leap, right? right? So S- Sam and I didn't believe in just leaping blindly off a cliff. Right. I think that's a misnomer. Like when people talk about that, those people have safety nets that they're not talking about, right? right? Sam and I did not have that safety net. So we took like a step down approach. So Sam was able to leave his job. Uh, he was a full-time designer at Bose and uh, doing very well there. And, um, you know, he left his full-time job at Bose and was doing freelance and teaching while we were doing the museum. And then he eventually left the the freelance and was just teaching and doing the museum because the teaching was the teaching and the education piece has always been kind of a common thread through a lot of the stuff. Yeah. I, and then I sort of followed behind, and I so see. we got to a point where we could both sort of be doing it. Now, by the time I did it and I was doing it full time, I sort of had this epiphany that like, you know, it was more established. We'd had a bunch of we had a program called Street Seats. We had an opening with three thousand people showed up, and we did an international design competition for public seating in South Boston. Dang. It was amazing. They just ran it again in Portland. It was, it was incredible. And if you look it up, you can see some of the videos and stuff from that. But um, yeah, designmuseumfoundation.org. And, uh, you know, it got, got to a point where I was like, okay, this is this is sort of becoming something that is, is bigger than, you know, what we'd imagined. And I didn't really want to do nonprofit arts administration right. at that point. I was right. Like, right. You know, yeah, I yeah. miss the other thing. And, and, and Sam's a natural at that stuff. And, and he's also a very talented designer. So, you know, I, I left that to go back to doing design work and, and teaching Um full-time so I got a, a contract at Wentworth to teach full-time for two years and uh, I was also doing a lot of freelance work in a bunch of different um, disciplines so I was doing yeah. software and I was doing uh, some product work um, and a lot of illustration work with a, a local company called Idea Paint um, and if you're familiar with them it's the dry erase paint that you put on the wall oh um, yeah yeah yeah. Cool. so I got a gig with them traveling around with them to different trade shows and doing uh Lar- lar- very large dry erase murals. Okay, that's uh, kind of fun. Yeah, it was it was bonkers. It was that was awesome. But yeah. you know, all that stuff was kind of happening at the same time. How did you start teaching without a grad graduate degree? Yeah, so so that's kind of how I find myself in the position I'm in now. So you can teach adjunct. Yeah, like Reed, you know, Reed teaches at Parsons, right. and 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 uh, you can teach adjunct without anything. So we were both teaching adjunct at Wentworth while we were doing programs with the museum, and in fact, we actually built a program with Wentworth around one of our exhibitions and the students and that was an unbelievable experience because the students built that exhibit from the ground up we sort of gave them our brand and they they took it and they raised money and they built it we installed it at the Prudential Center there for for two weeks and you know foot traffic was amazing that was that was a really exciting thing for us to be like yeah this could work you know that was sort of the proof of that and you know kudos to to Sam Montague and the people over at Wentworth for seeing that and be like yeah this will be cool Uh, because that could have gone really really poorly um, and, and, you know, we, we adjunct, you can do, you can do contract without having a master's degree for up to a couple of years, depending on the school. But after that, um, it's see you later. And that's what happened to me. So my contract ran out, um, and I was just doing freelance and you guys are both freelancers. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you, you, I've heard you talk about this a couple of times. For me, it was a very isolating experience because mm-hmm. I wasn't embedded. I was getting client work and, but I, I thrive on people. Mm-hmm. Like, I really, okay. I like if you put me in a room by myself, I'll be fine, you know, for yeah. a period of time. Yeah. And I can humor myself and make myself laugh and <laughs> come up with all these things. And, uh, you know, and that's that's good for a while. But I do need that that interaction. And right. so when it got to a point where I was kind of doing that stuff alone, I get all my work done and it would be the middle of the day. And I'm like, okay, well, I can, I can hunt down more work. Yeah. But 
I didn't need to because I had a lot of other work that was coming in for other stuff. So I would just go for like a four hour walk. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, man, this is weird. Like, I just, it just wasn't for me. Mm. Um, uh, so I started, you know, taking calls, you know, and saying, you know, entertaining other other things. And the freelance work was coming in, and it was it was going great. Um, and one of my old students, uh, who I'd worked with, called me up. And he was working at Hasbro. There's a lot of people calling you up, Derek. Yeah, it's cool. I like that. I'm on the phone a lot. <laughs> do you want to um, do you want to say your phone number? On the that's, no, uh, you know, I was listening to Kelly's when Kelly was on talking about how she doesn't like being on the phone and how that she's sort of gotten over that and like right, likes right. being on the phone. I have no problem being on the phone. <laughs> got it, and got I learned it. that actually when I was in school working at that property management thing because I was terrible on the phone. I'd pick it up and be like, "Hello, this is Derek." I'm uh, uh, and I wouldn't know what to say and and but I got real good at at, at streamlining my conversation and mm. thinking ahead of what I was going to say and how I was going to do mm. that. Got so it. again, the presentation skills, yeah. Yeah. you got to you got to you got to practice them over and over and over again. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Eric called me up and said, "Hey, listen, we've got an opening on the Marvel team, everything in my head, my heart, everything was like, this is the one. Yeah. Like, this is the job that you've been waiting for. Yeah. And because um, I'm a huge Marvel fan and, and, and um, you know, toys have played an integral part of my life. Yeah. And, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I got in there and it was great. I mean, the people at, at that company were phenomenal. A lot of my friends, I already knew a lot of people that worked there. A lot of my friends worked there. People from RIT were working there. Some of my closest friends were, were there as well, and a lot of my students mm. had gotten co-ops and internships there. So they're taking me on the tour, and I'm going through the shop, and all these people came up to me, and the woman that was taking me on the tour goes, what is going on? Because I just need a minute. <laughs> you know, I just said hi to everybody. And, uh, and so I did that for a while, and it was it was great. Um, I was a design manager on that team, so I worked. I was lead designer on all the Thor Ragnarok toys. Okay. And, oh, my and, gosh. You know, it, was, it was a really exciting experience, and the team there is really phenomenal. But so this it, is very recent. Yeah, 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 yeah. About two years ago. Wow. Um, but uh, as awesome as that was, the commute was insane. I was driving an hour and a half back and forth Ooh. from from work, and I was thinking, like, do I want to move down there, and what am I going to do? Where is uh? They're in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, really, really, uh, really great company. And um, I got a phone call. Oh yeah, another one from <laughs> from from the head of of uh, of Wentworth's design program, and he said, hey, listen, you want to grab dinner? And I said. Yeah, I always want to grab, you know, I'm happy to do that. And he said, listen, you know, we sat down and he said, we want you to come back. We want you to come back full time, um, which means you need a master's degree, but we'll, we'll help you, you know, figure that out. And uh, that was great because, again, teaching has been at the core of everything that I've been doing for a very long time. Even when I was in school, you know, mentoring younger designers and, and even when I was a new, you know, new designer going back and taking, participating in crits and that kind of stuff. And... Uh, and I've been back since. So I, I left Hasbro, which is tough. Um, but uh, I still stay in touch with all those guys. Never, yeah. ever close a door. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I have now been teaching full time for two years and getting my master's degree. Um, and of course, because I'm stupid, um, maybe, we, uh, we also started up a, a small educational board game company that spun out of a project that we did at Wentworth. Um, yeah, I saw this. It's the Fourth Law Labs. Yep, correct? that's correct. Yep. Okay. And... I looked at the very first board game. It's a sector vector. Yeah, that's correct. And it's it has math involved. Yes, it does. And te- make tape measures. It yeah. was it was quite intense. Yeah. I so I we had a couple. So Wentworth, um, Wentworth's a really great school. We, university. We recently got university status, which is really exciting. What? How does that happen? Uh, so you have to qualify to be a university versus oh. a college, and there's certain criteria that you have to meet with regards to uh, master's programs and accreditation criteria and all this kind of stuff. Can we so, be a college? No. Can minor <laughs> details college? Uh, well, maybe. How, I don't want to say no. Uh, <laughs> you could. Send in your tuition yeah, yeah, yeah. to... Uh... I think, I, I, I've heard this as well, mm. that the university and college difference is, there, there's a difference in the European market, for mm. sure. Yeah. The difference between university and college, but I haven't heard of it in... Oh yes, America. Yeah, I didn't even know that was. A yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And uh, and it comes with a lot of. There's a lot of stuff that comes along with that. It means hmm. you you have to do research and and there's more oh, to it, right? Oh right. What, so is Virginia Tech a university? Yeah, they they're intense research. Yeah, I guess I guess SCAD's a college. Yeah, maybe it's a university. I don't know. I don't Savannah know College of Art and Design. That was actually my first. I was going to go there when I was in high school. That was my first pick. Okay. For school, um, but uh, I didn't apply. <laughs> yeah, I didn't apply. Uh, Savannah was too far from. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, the uh, the world of higher education 
is unlike anything that I had ever really like. Once you become full time in it and you start seeing it, uh, it's it's very different. It's very much like a business, like a company, yeah. but um, there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of stuff For that sure. goes into that. For sure. And you're, you're working with a very different kind of, you know, faculty. There's faculty and then there's administration and there's there's a lot of nuance right. to that. Right. Does working within an organization, like the many organizations that you worked mm. with, does that give you any insight into how to work in a university or is it completely different politics? Uh, no, a lot of it's very similar. Okay. Um, but on a, on, a, on a surprisingly bigger scale. Because huh. there's a lot more, there's a lot of competing um, goals. Yeah, a lot of times when you're working at a company, there could be goals, but everybody's kind of working towards the same thing, right? right. You got to sell and make the money and get the business and all that kind of stuff. Right. That's part of that's part of that's one of the the goals at a university. But you also have this other component to it too, and like the what's your product? Right. Your product is education. Yeah. yeah. And that's a hard thing. Now that's one of the reasons I wanted to teach was because you know I wanted my products to live on longer, and it's a weird way to think about it, but mm. it kind of does, right? Like it's it's not this thing that goes away potentially that's a whole other topic too and we can talk about sort of the longevity of design and this weird thing that's going around right now with regards to you know, i don't want to design stuff it's just going to go in a landfill oh right yeah. cool. there's there's a lot <laughs> that's it, a whole can of worms right there it is but i think it's an important one because it ties yeah. into the student piece so mm-hmm. let me finish the sector vector thing and then right. we can open up this other yeah. part um okay so <laughs> don't worry about that yeah the, I mean, let's the, turn off the clock for no, you no no that's good so Sector Vector, two professors from uh, the sciences came to us. And uh, it was a physicist, James O'Brien, who's a physicist, and uh, Greg Sorokin, who's a chemist. And they had this game to teach vector math to ve- vector arithmetic. No, I, I have no clue what okay. vector arithmetic so, is. So you do, you do. Really, it, it, you know, it's getting from point A to point B. Like triangles? Right. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, right? How do you triangulate to a point? And, like, if you're moving in a, in a particular trajectory with a certain amount of velocity... Right, and you change direction. Where are you going to end up? Okay, right in yeah. space, for mm-hmm. instance. There's a vacuum. There's no wind. So all right. this kind of stuff. Right, it's been an education for me too to learn like all of this this stuff at the same time, and for my students. And so they came to us, say, well, "Listen, we've got this game, and it was a protract. They had a great rule set. Everybody, they're both av- avid gamers, board games. They had this protractor with a little Star Trek ship they glued onto the top and some paper clips and string. Oh. And they said, "Here's how you do it, right?" And they played it. They tested this. Yeah. And the students loved it. And they said, "But well, we want to make this into a real product." Well, we know people on campus that they didn't really know us, but there are people on campus who do this. Right. So right. they came to us, and within like three seconds, they said, "I want to do it. We're going to take it on as a studio." So I built a studio around redesigning this game. That's awesome. And uh, it was an unbelievable studio experience for myself for the students yeah. we, we hand built they came back over the summer to actually hand build four additional copies on top of the two we we had made um the students tore this game down to the studs and we prototyped and designed all kinds we there's a couple videos around the design process that we went through and and you know it blew James and Greg away because they had never experienced what design could actually do. Yeah. You know, they thought, oh, we'll have this like slightly better. Right. I mean, my uh, proud teacher here, but like my students knocked this thing out of the park to the point where eventually, you know, they had the intellectual property and they came up with the original game. Um, and the students, we made this, they play tested it for four years. So this happened before I went to Hasbro. We had, we'd done this. And then when I left and came back, they'd been playing this now. We've been playing now for four years, but at the time it was two. And um, it was it was solid enough that with a little bit of redesign work, like we were able to productize that, and now it's it's in the world for real, and we have it in schools, and other students are playing, which was the goal of this to begin with. Um, you know, other students in other schools are playing this and learning how to do vector math. It's really exciting. Now, did you produce this on your own? Yes. So you, you worked with the vendors and everything to yeah. get it made and everything. Yeah. Well, we worked with a with a group, a great group. If you're looking to develop board games, I'm going to plug. Grand Prix International on okay. Springfield, Mass. Because, mm. man, what an awesome experience that was. Yeah. It went really, really well. And they helped us do sort of the overseas negotiation okay. stuff and, like, the middlemen between us and the factory. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we brought we brought this thing to life, and, and it's it's a real thing now. It's crazy. Yeah, it looks awesome. I mean, really cool, like, a space game. You have, like, this uh, whiteboard where you can – whiteboard inspired by your uh, whiteboard. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Uh, no, the funny, the funny thing is, you know, we, we, we classify it as a gamified lab kit mm. and the whole thing, the whole premise for this game originally came out of the fact that Greg and, and James had gone to a conference and learned about gamified education and it was, it felt pretty flat. You know, it's like, oh, we're, instead of calling it grade points, we're going to call it experience points. Well, it's the same thing though, right? Mm. Right. Can, you know, 
psychologically maybe the students inter- but we want we wanted to actually make a game like yeah. gamify this experience right. that's typically very boring and um so it was an awesome experience for for my industrial design students to learn about this stuff to have a client effectively the physics students were involved uh because they play tested and they gave feedback to the so these students that never mesh that that very rarely come together are learning about the fact that the design process and the scientific method super parallel they are similar. there's so mm-hmm. much there mm-hmm. um and so that that turned into just an awesome experience we've since gone on and done a second game we ran another studio um i've been working we brought in another another professor um franz ruckert who's who's another doctor i'm the only non-doctor so we'll go to conferences and say this is dr o'brien this is dr sirachman this is dr ruckert mr cassio oh, oh man. could you at least say professor cassio they say no please go to the back and I'm like, Great. <laughs> so yeah please sit down um but uh it's been an awesome it's been an awesome experience to to be able to interact with folks that and find all this overlap and parallel and um it's really been key to one of the tenants at wentworth which is what they call epic uh which is sort of externally collaborative project-based interdisciplinary culture oh so yeah it's a, it's a, uh yes <laughs> okay yeah let's let's jam this in there so we can call it epic. <laughs> right, right, that's right. true that's true but not to sound too too cynical about the whole thing because it has it has been a really cool framework for us to build these projects off of and bring really awesome experiences to the students so we've done that. We've done a couple of projects I can't talk about yet with some recent studio courses mm. that I've run. It's opened up the doorway for us to be able to bring in outside people to work with. And oh, wow. um, there's been some pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Someday, I think two, two months I can talk about it. But okay. yeah. very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see that part. Yeah, that'll be neat. So, so now you are, are you, this is kind of your current state. You're working on this board game stuff. Yeah, that's Just sort of the, the the fourth law lab stuff is a little slower than I'd like right now because I'm finishing up my master's degree. Okay, um, which is how an close MBA. are you? I'm done in April. Oh, it's wow. amazing. Okay, I cannot wait. Yeah, that'd uh, be exciting. I'll get some of my life back, which is great. <laughs> but that's been a cool experience too. I mean, that's that's a I'm getting an MBA from Northeastern. That's online program too. Yeah. And as a designer and as an educator, I am hypercritical of the state <laughs> of online education right oh. now. And you know, the conversation comes up a lot, like, oh, could you can you do online design programs? And like, you know, education, this is a good segue into sort of the, yeah. the the future of education and stuff. But, you know, online's good for certain things. I think there's so much information out there now. Mm. When you're talking to students, they're, why am I even here? You know, like, well, why do you go to college? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you don't need to anymore. Maybe the future is going to change and that higher education industry and what that's like is going to dramatically shift. For design, it's different because you really do need access to facilities, mm-hmm. uh, of which Wentworth has some phenomenal facilities. Their shop is just amazing. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons, and I don't build. You know, I was also very shop averse. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. my thing. Not my thing. <laughs> I would Breaking like there. to. I would. I mean, it's it's definitely something that I want to yeah, build my skill set in. I just sit and look in the yeah. window of the shop, and I'm like, wow, look at all these people. They but, know what they're doing. And, and we pri- we have some unbelievable 3D designers that we work with, mm. um, and our students leave being able to make like they're makers oh, that's in awesome. addition to other uh, everything else that is a core tenant though of what we like you have to learn the craft um and be able to really you know that craft is a big part of what we do right um and as things sort of you know whip back around from this digital revolution back into sort of hey remember physical things mm-hmm. you know we're we're seeing them succeed because of because of that i'd say we have a fairly good well-rounded program overall we're kind of a dark horse in the design community but hmm. okay our goal is to sort of push that up yeah but going back to that question yeah. question though because yeah. i get it occasionally yeah. too of you know people messaging me or saying hey does design really need to be do you really need to go to college or is it yeah. possible to learn it all online and collaborate with others or i don't know so i think there are a lot of aspects to the college experience for design that you you may not be able to replicate outside of of a studio environment like that. It's like uh, one I can think of is collaboration for sure. Absolutely. There's a lot of soft skills involved and learning about and even about like design as a art form itself. Like, yeah. It's hard to learn composition and form like over the internet, you know. Well, and also just looking how far you like your career was propelled by the relationships that you started in school. Right. You right. Know? And that's that's a big part of my career yeah. is like the connections that I made in school yeah. and then subsequently after. Now, I didn't have Instagram and right. social media and LinkedIn. Thank God. And CarFlow <laughs> and Behance. Well, that's a really good thing. You know, yeah. so, so if we want Wait. to talk about that. Yeah, okay. 
Well, you, you want to add something? Oh, no, I, I thought Coreflot was around back then. It was, like Michael said, you know, it was just sort of that text. It, 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 the, the portfolio component of that, there were like 10 portfolios when I was in school. Oh, okay. Mm. I mean, okay. very early days. Okay. Course okay. 77 kind of was, a th- you know, it was building. Right, right. It was just starting. Um, it was Got just it. starting. You know, Google was new. Like, Facebook was only two years old. Okay. Like, to put some... some Got perspective it. around uh, that. Sorry, sorry guys. We would, we, would only see, times. Similar, we would only see good work. And I tell my students this, they go, that sounds insane. But we would only see work if we went to an IDSA conference and there was a, there was a designer somewhere who had a portfolio that you heard about. <laughs> and you hunted this person down that's and you crazy. said, let me see that drawing. And you know, you're like, that's what that is. So this is why one of those, like oh. seeing the connections, students today have access to more information than the history of mankind at every second of every day, like now it's the most. Yeah. Now it's the most. Yep. Yeah. Now it's, right. So, so more information than they probably know what to do. Exactly. With. So, you know, what's the role of the educator in a lot of this? It's like, look, you got to supplement your education with outside stuff, right? One of the downfalls of design education is that we get limited time. I spend a lot of time at the studio after hours because there's only so many time hours in a day, right? And you get so many contact hours with a student, and you know, some of my students will hopefully be listening to this, um, you know. We, we try to make sure that we can give them enough contact time so that you can have a meaningful critique on mm-hmm. something, which is very hard to do. And, you know, you're teaching your drawing class, you get two hours twice a week, and there's 15 kids in the class. We'll do the math. It's not a lot of time with each student. Right. So, so you have to supplement, for all the students out there, you have to supplement your design education with the stuff that's out there. And you have more of it than you've ever had before. I mean, you mm-hmm. can see what good work is. Yeah. And you can hold yourself to, okay, that's the bar. But that can be very daunting, right? And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing with social media and, and Instagram yeah. and, and, you know, the proliferation of online portfolios where the work is, is stunning, right? Yeah. It's very, you see all this stuff and you go, and you guys talked about this a little bit before. So go back and listen to those episodes if you haven't. Um, but <laughs> You can run the podcast. Good, no, 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 <laughs> we can walk so, away. <laughs> so, yeah, jump in, please. I, I will just go no, on no, forever. No, this is great. Um, no, this is great. awesome. The, I'm joking. The, the fact that there has been... So much work out there can be overwhelming. And you say, oh, my, I'm never going to get to that level, mm. right? Well, I never thought of it. Personally, I never thought of it like that. Like that that bar, there's your Scott Robertson. There's your, there's your, the, the top of the, you know, the best of the best. But I'll get there eventually. This was always in my head. Like I will get there eventually if I right. put enough time in and do right. this kind of stuff. But hey, I see this other person and that actually looks achievable. So for me, I see it as like a scaffolding mm, kind of thing. Like step ladder. It's a, it is yeah, like yeah. a step ladder, right? And so I may not be that good there, but I can definitely, I feel like I could get to here. Right, yeah. Right? And that's one of the, re- you know, I post my stuff up there. My stuff is not fantastic. It's okay, right? But when I do that, I think about, okay, well, if I was in school and I saw me, I'd be like, yeah, I could probably get to that, <laughs> right? Like I can get to that next level, I can get to that right. next level. So we're all trying to work up that ladder. Yeah. So I try not to get overwhelmed by that stuff. And I try to tell my students that too, is like, look, you know, I can teach you what I know and you can see what's out there. And there's other people out there that can teach you what they know and they do on YouTube and all this kind of stuff. It's amazing. I would have, I had to buy DVDs, Noman Workshop, put out these DVDs, concept art stuff, but turns out super applicable to the product design world. Mm. And I learned most of my techniques. You know, I had two drawing classes in school. That was it, right? Mm. So we did we did technically three, but two that were product design based. And the rest of it was me learning from other industries, right? Yeah. And that's mm. another great parallel. Like there's so much work being done in other industries, illustration, painting, you know, filmmaking, all this stuff that you can apply to industrial design. Yeah. And that's where, I, that's where most of my skill set kind of built up. Now the flip side to this, Nick, around the Instagram thing is like, on one hand, you go, oh my God, this is so daunting. The other side of this, which I was not really aware of and cognizant of until recently, and it was brought to my attention by uh, a fellow coworker of mine, Carly Hagens, mm. who's over at Notre Dame now, getting her master's. Yeah. Um, phenomenal designer, excellent. We were teaching together and she said, you know, I'm seeing this happen where the students are getting, they're posting their work. Their work is maybe not up to the level that it should be, or it needs, right. you know, a student I, needs work, students, right? Yeah, sure, students. sure. Right. But their friends, who aren't designers or don't know anything about design, they're liking it like crazy. And they think in their head, like, oh, this is good work. Mm. So when you tell them, listen, this is, oh, well, I've got a bunch of likes. It's like so, false, yes, false hope yes, in a way. Yes. So, so that, that sort of inflation, you no, know, not every student does this, right? This isn't like permeating every single student, right, right. but it is a trend that I'm seeing happen, right? And, and, uh, and, and maybe it's not even a cognizant thing. No, I mean, when, no. When, even when you and I post work, it's like, oh, hey, 
this one got more likes than this one. This one must have been bad. This one must have been good. Right. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. It, it's not even something we acknowledge. It's, it's something a dangerous like, spiral. It's almost like something oh, yeah. in the back of our yeah. head. That you we try not to. Uh, yeah. You know, and I think that it's, um, there's some great books out there now. iGen, which is an awesome book about sort of the next generation and, you know, kids who've grown up with iPhones in their hands from day one. Right. And like how that's affected stuff. Um, it's a double-edged sword, right? I think Instagram is an amazing tool. Yeah. It's an amazing tool. You can get access to some of the best work and communicate directly with and ask questions and, and get freelance work and tie into this community. The flip side of that, though, is is you're chasing that, you know, that dopamine hit and you're yeah. getting all that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, you just have to be very careful with it and, and not allow – you have to become very cognizant of what is good work, right? Mm. And know that my work is not good work without letting it destroy you. Right. And that's something that I spent a long time on when I was in school. Like, I know extremely, I am very objective about my stuff. Like, I know if this is good and where it needs to be or if it's not good mm. and what it needs. And that comes with time, right? That's experience and it comes with you doing it for a long time. Right. But I'm not, you know, I don't let it hinder me. Like, okay, I'm going to keep going. Like, Yeah, keep pressing forward, keep, keep improving. You got to keep moving forward. It's, it's iteration and evolution. You know, yeah. you're never going to... No one ever sits down and pumps out that perfect Behance project like no. in a night. No, uh-uh. you know? no, and I think that's part of the th- that false illusion that that's what's happening, and right. it's not. And and you've talked about it before too, like the the awesome sketch. You know, we talk about these sketches, and you got to be a good sketcher. You met Dieter Rams. You've seen Dieter Rams sketches. They're not great, yeah. but they're communicative, right? right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we always talk about drawing at school like a language, right? Right. You can be conversational in a language. You can become fluent in a language. If you're conversational and drawing and like you can communicate, that might be enough if you've got all these other skill sets. If you want to spend the time and practice and do it all the time, you become fluent in it, right? Right. And and when you're fluent in it, your communication is clearer, but maybe not to, it's only clear if the other person is also fluent because if you speak fluent in another language too fast, they don't understand, right? There's all these parallels oh, to like the things that we do in everyday yeah, life. I Turns out that. design process permeates everything, right? right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there like yeah we were we were kind of talking about this before the podcast started but mm. you know there's there's ways in which different people approach industrial design on Instagram like I would say even just for myself like I approach it in a way that I would not necessarily approach it professionally yeah but I am curious about the effect that that has on the people who are following me especially students like are they seeing that work and saying that this is what professional industrial design looks like. And, you know, I, I'm just curious. I mean, when my students talk about you, James, <laughs> on, on a regular basis, they say, this is what professional design Do they just say that receipts guy or, or the other guy? <laughs> uh, What's well, funny, though, it, you know, it is kind of funny because when I go back and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, James, and they're, they're like, who? And I'm like, oh, uh, at I draw on receipts. Oh, yeah, I follow him. You know, it's kind of funny how that, that has changed the landscape of that. Right. I think to your point, you know, that comes back to the question of, well, what does that mean? Like, what is the professional world of industrial design. It includes Instagram now, Yeah. right? So I think it comes down to, you know, us as professional designers or as teachers explaining to students like how that works and how right. to conduct yourself and what these things can mean and the fact that you have to be open to all of it and learn how to sift through it. Mm. And and I think th- this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, but one of the roles of an educator is kind of a curator right. for stuff right. to a degree, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I may be the first line of... of defense so to speak when it comes to hey this is good stuff you should check this out because they're they're handling these things uh, well because yeah. they don't necessarily know where to look yeah. right because right. there is so much stuff out there and maybe i have a little bit more insight into some of that but they bring stuff to me too hmm. it's one of the reasons i like to teach is you know you have that two-way conversation and they yeah. might bring something to me and like oh that's really interesting and it sparks a new thought yeah and again you know education and and education as a design project yeah is an awesome one. Just same way that organizations can be, you know, Kelly talked about this too, like building the business is a design project. The museum was the same way. We viewed that as a big design project. Yeah. Yeah. And you iterate on it and you refine it and you hone the story and you put out new deliverables and all this stuff. Education is the same way. Like, how can I communicate this information better? How can I change this project up or bring a new experience so that it triggers something else? Not giving answers directly. Mm. Students hate that, right? Yeah. Like, you know, they just, just tell me if it's right or wrong. <laughs> You're... <laughs> Yeah, Th- that is not you know again for the students listening out there, that's not how it works. Right. right, it doesn't work like that in the real world either. To some degree, there can be multiple right answers. Yeah, right? there can be many wrong answers. 
Well, um, just like you were talking about, about the parallels between science and design, it's like a thesis is basically, you know, it's like you are basically formulating every single argument you can against something to right. strengthen your argument for something. Right. And it's, and so if you bring some a thesis to somebody too early in the process, it's like, well, I don't know. Have you considered all the arguments against it? Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean the steel manning of a of a of a of an argument or of a design story or of a a, a notion when it comes to a form, for instance, you know, yeah. you you have to do that, and that's you know we call it design thinking. You hear design thinking get talked about a lot, right? right. I mean, yeah. IDEO coined that phrase and stuff. It's just thinking. I mean, yeah. to be clear, it's just thinking. Right? <laughs> it, it is. It is, and thinking really is about like playing through these scenarios and coming to these conclusions. And we do it visually, right? Right. So, okay, what happens if I do this? And you run the whole thing out and you yeah. do all these in parallel and you produce all of this stuff to figure out what the best, you know, synthesis of all of these other things are. And that's really the designer's job is to translate and synthesize every other thing that's out there mm-hmm. so that everybody can be on the same page yeah. and yeah. we can have a conversation or multiple, uh, right? Yeah. Now, now, Derek, I also have a, another question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're a professor and... You get to see the the inside world of these students. Mm. Are there anything that the current student generation is lacking? We have a lot of students that listen. Yeah, yeah. So we see a lot of the the notion that like design thinking and design strategy. It's very appealing, right? To to do a lot of the front end stuff. They're really good on the research, mm-hmm. really good on the on the you know story crafting component of it. So the students are good at that part. At least. Uh, you're, from you're, what I've seen, my students are good at that. I, I've seen other schools too. You know, I spend a lot okay. of time talking to other students as well. Right. It seems like they've got that down. We're missing some of the technical stuff, right, from a lot of portfolios that I, I tend to see. Like sketching? and Sketching, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts okay. kind of stuff um, because it does require more hours at the table that's true. to mm-hmm. do, you know. I think that's part of it. And there's this sort of notion that if I don't get it right the first time, like I'm never going to get it right. Mm. And the attention spans a little shorter now too, like mm. a lot of distractions. I see this a lot. And you know, it's it's something you have to be cognizant of. Again, students like multitasking is not a thing. Like you can't be on your phone watching YouTube and sanding a model. You're going to sand a hole right through that model. <laughs> James is a big multitasker. Yeah. Am I? Well, you tell me that when you like you like to work with the TV oh. on, the computer on. Well, I I, I, I think it's important though. There's a differentiation <laughs> between if you do something that you've overlearned, right? Yeah. Students haven't overlearned anything yet, mm. right? When you've been working as a designer for ten years and you've drawn a million things, that that upfront part of it. It's hard to do with the thing on and the phone at your iPad. But when you actually have to execute a drawing, like I can do that with 17 things on because I'm not thinking about it actively anymore. Right. I'm just doing it. Right. Right. Yeah. For me, it's it's a way to focus, honestly. And mm. it's probably a terrible way to focus. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's like putting on, it's like essentially being in the middle of a studio. This is especially when I'm at home working. It's like... There's just complete silence. Oh, you don't like and the silence. And yeah, that's hard for me too. Yeah, the silence. I, I sit in silence and sketch sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, sometimes you have to, right? If if I'm doing very like I have to write. If I'm writing anything, it has oh, yeah. to be completely silent. Oh yeah. Um, right. You know, so when I when I see students and they've got all of these things going on and they're sanding something and I'm like, you should really pay attention to yeah. that. And then you know they they go down too far. And I think part of it too is like that critical attention to detail typos. Oh my goodness. Mm. I mean, you can't. I see a lot of typos. It's the easiest thing to fix. My students will hear this and laugh because I go, I rail on it all the time. Yeah. And it's one of the first things you see. Like I catch typos now like crazy. Oh, the yeah. minute it's the first thing I see when it comes up on a screen and a lot of professional designers will see that. I remember second year, somebody writing like their name, second year, industrial design. Yeah, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. No, I. <laughs> Don't do that. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff. I think, you know, students... Um, I think there's there's a perception too that I got to be careful how I say this, but you should pursue your passion, right? Yeah. You should pursue your passion. That doesn't mean that you wait f- to get your passion job right out of school. Mm. Oh, that yeah. Okay, we've had this conversation. Do you too, find students like sitting on opportunities and not not going for them? No, not not as much, not as much. But when I do hear that, like, oh, I just want to work at my like, I'm passionate about this. I just want to work in that job, and they maybe just don't pursue other stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. That's, that's the thing. It's like they'll apply to their five favorite jobs right. and yeah. then don't get in, and then it's like, oh, I, what yeah. I do now? Or yeah. they'll, or they'll of, like, wait. Shotgun and yeah. you know, I didn't have the luxury of being able to wait. 
I was not going to be able to stay on health insurance. So all, all this other real world stuff that right, comes into play. Right. And you start also learning about all that real world stuff faster when you don't have the ability to to sit on that, right? right. And, and there's so much to be said for just getting that job, paying off those loans, and also learning a ton. I mean, yeah. I was not passionate about lighting, but I liked the people I was going to be working with, and I learned a ton in my first job. Yeah. That was so important. That well, was so I think, important. I think that like, there's a really amazing lesson when it comes to just, just hearing about your story, which is you had these jobs, but you also had these side hustles mm. like the design museum. It's like, you know, you might not find that perfect fit in that job that's going to be like the world changing, world saving job. But you got, but, you got, that was only like, eight hours of your day. You yeah. know, you got other hours. In your yeah. Day. I want to piggyback on something that James just said. Yeah. yeah. He said the world saving job. Yeah. All right. This is a big one. <laughs> We're not going to have enough time to cover all this stuff, but I want to throw this out there. Yeah. I'm here. I'm seeing a trend happening now. This mm-hmm. is happening with students, but I'm seeing this come out of things like IDSA and, and other stuff as well. Like this notion that, they have to save the world, yeah. right? Like, how can design save the world? How, like, and my students, I've had this conversation with my students too, that, where they feel overwhelmed going back to, I'm making this stuff that's just going to end up in a landfill or how do I, you know, I'm not going to save the world. Time out. The first thing you need to do as a student is show up to my class on time. <laughs> right? Before, but I'm serious. Like, like let's start, let's start with that. Like, don't right. get overwhelmed yeah. by the fact that like you, you feel like the, the world, first off, to save the world, like, the world is actually doing, in my opinion, now granted, there are problems. Of course, there are always going to be problems, but we're actually doing pretty well. I mean, if you look at the history of, of humanity, like we've done some amazing things, right? Yeah, I'm right. very much an optimist. I'm, a, I'm an optimist about technology. I'm an optimist about human nature. I'm an optimist about a lot of things. Right. Let's just work on you getting the skills so when you, are, when you have the opportunity to make a change, yeah. to make a difference, you can do it. Mm, that's yeah. it, right? Good Number way one. To say that it. is like, oh, that's such a perfect way to encapsulate yeah. that. Yeah. And the, the, the follow up part to that is make sure that you are thinking about what you can do, not just with yourself, but like kind of locally around you mm. too. Like, like if you have an opportunity to make a change, and again, design, designers are are we can visualize change we can Mm -hmm. we can bring change to life we can we can think about how something might be better we can visualize that stuff but we can't do it alone right right this is a team sport right so it's not design is not going to change the world necessarily or save the world yeah we can bring shape to it and we can do that stuff but we can't do it by ourselves right and you can't expect everybody else to be able to have that's one of the things that makes us special in a lot of ways at least as designers is that you can do all this stuff at the same time at least when it comes to imagining what outcomes can be and synthesizing all this other stuff yeah i don't want everybody being able to not necessarily being able to, but everybody doing that at the same time too. You need the specialist. You need the person that can take that vision that everybody agrees on, satisfies the things that they are concerned about. Yeah. And that's the hardest part, right? Is satisfying everybody's concerns and bringing that to the next level. And if we, so again, you know, get on my soapbox, but if we think that we're the only ones that can do that alone too, it, that's a that's a really detrimental and very arrogant thing to, yeah. to, to think. Yeah. Um, and I don't hear that from a lot of stuff, but when I do hear it, it's meted with it's greeted with like applause. Yeah. And I'm like, ooh, that's not good. Like it's, that worries yeah, me. Yeah, it's such a cheap applause trick though. It that's yep. what it feels yep. like. But yeah, I, I think something something occurred to me and and I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about this. But you know, we're talking about like the fourth law thing mm. where you got in touch, you like this was this cross disciplinary yeah. thing to explain a phenomenon. And I think as designers, I also, my wife is in PR. I feel like uh, a lot of times there are these industries that basically have to take this ingenious work that's done by the specialists. It's done by the scientists, Mm. by the physicists, by people in technology. And we have to give it shape and life or at least be able to communicate like what exactly they accomplished so that it can be a benefit for everybody. Because there are people that are sitting on like mounds of of really rich good information things that would benefit uh everybody right. but but to give that you have to give that a form that everybody can then adopt yeah what well, you know yeah I, so yeah. i don't know that's very true yeah it's I I, I, it's just it's something that and that's, it, i'm not trying to say that we shouldn't try and make you should always be trying to make the world a better place yeah but we have to also agree on what that means right right and and and, and agree on on what we can do as designers to bring that to the fore and you know people working and having jobs is also really important right to making sure that everybody 
proliferates and continues to do stuff. So, you know, making products is not a bad thing. And I think that sometimes it gets that that stigma of like, well, it's just going to end up in a landfill. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly Mm -hmm. or possibly not. I still have all my toys from when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like uh, maybe. Right. But if you don't make the record player, you don't get the Walkman, you don't get the Discman, you don't get the iPhone, right, the right. iPod to the iPhone, right. to PayPal, to SpaceX. Yeah. Like, yeah. You don't land that rocket if you don't make all that other stuff. Right. And and I don't know. I, I just I it's, try to it's take the a little, wider view. It's the little changes too. Yeah. yeah. Like I think we I mentioned it in the Dieter Rams episode. It was like, you know, it it's not like Dieter Rams went into Braun and made these amazing designs. He just like took Braun and said, Hey, what if we just improve the prove this like lid what if we just add these yeah. knobs in a very organized manner like what yeah. if we just did very like simple clean improvements mm. and i think that's really how you you progress and create this like kind of better society yeah and again you know i'm not the authority on any of this kind of stuff right. just thoughts that i've had while i've been going through oh, this yeah. well we aren't the authorities on the but, but, but I, think, I think one of the things that is nice about this format or like what you guys are trying to do and like having those conversations you know i look forward to the comments on this stuff to see if somebody else Th- thinks I'm off base with that thinking. Right. Or, you know, I I welcome that stuff and it helps me codify how I'm going to perceive this stuff as we talk about it with students who are are going to be inheriting all of this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And thinking about how they move forward in it. I think again the, the the big takeaway for me right there is that, you know, let's start small and work our way up to saving the world. And right. let's start by, you know, again, let's get your portfolio together. Let's get your thinking thinking the right way about how to solve problems. Yeah. That's really at the core of it, right? Like, right. Be creative, be, be clever, bring design to studio for us to talk about, right? It's not, don't just look, which one do you like? It's not about what I like. It's about how can you defend your point of view mm-hmm. and how can you encapsulate that stuff so, again, you learn how to steel man your position, like yeah. James was saying. Yeah. And and we can't have that conversation if you don't come with work. Right. And you can't be expected to save the world if you can't deliver your deadline at school. Yeah. You right. know? So it's that kind of thing. And, and again, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to the students out there uh, with, you know, with every amount of positivity and, and the fact that I think you can all do that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, it's exciting when the students do that and I like seeing them come in with that. And that's what makes my job interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, we'll, we'll end on one last question, Derek. Yeah. What, what's the future for you? What are you oh, excited man. about? Well, I just got married recently. Oh, congrats. So hopefully buying a house. Yeah. Be- <laughs> and you, had, by Thank the you. way, had one of the coolest weddings I've ever seen. Thank you, you guys went to Iceland? Yeah, we did. We got Whoa, married in Iceland. Iceland. It was wild. Yeah. Um, it was it was really awesome. Was Very, it cold? Uh, it was about 55 degrees. Okay. It got colder throughout the day, well, the actual wedding day. But no, it was it was an amazing experience. And um, yeah, I mean, I was, it it hit me way harder than i thought it was going to be like like i was very emotional uh-huh. on that day i was very surprised at myself i was like what's happening and like I was, it, was, it was uh no it was a really wonderful wonderful experience and uh so now we're on the house hunt but i think professionally you know i i really enjoy teaching um i plan on continuing to do that getting your master's that's once exciting. that's done yeah in april mm-hmm. which is great um yeah. you know I, I see myself taking on some more freelance work and really spending more time getting the fourth law lab stuff off the ground hopefully being able to spend some time going back and supporting the museum more um because you know i was involved in the, on the board and other things after i left i haven't been able to do much with that um because i've been so busy with other stuff um and i've got some ideas for some other projects that oh. i'd like to do okay um i've wanted to do a so i wanted to get back into animation for a long time oh. so i think that might be something that i dip my toe back into uh that's cool coming up so i haven't been very active online recently either uh you know, I liked doing the streaming and stuff, but I, I just have not had the chance to do that. So that's something right. I'd like to get back into too. I really right. enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's another way for me to get more access to my uh, access hours with my students too. Right. A lot of them tune in to your live streams. To my live streams, I can okay. get another hour lesson in there. That's great. Yeah. Which that's is really awesome. cool. You know, or answer questions that maybe we don't get to cover in class because right. everybody's doing other stuff. So for me, that platform has been a really awesome tool. Yeah. Um, I think others can use it that way as well. Which, real quick, one last thing. I know we're running out of time, but the way that teachers can use or just professionals can use Instagram to set a good example to your point, James, of what that is and how we handle ourselves professionally on that platform. And the fact that the students are there, so we as teachers need to be there too, mm. I think is really important. We have I work with a, a gentleman, Simon Williamson. He goes by Row Zero. Mm. Just unbelievable work. Mm. And he posts all the time. And it's super inspirational for the students. That is awesome. And you know, I'd love to see more, more educators 
involved in that posting work and being active in a way that they can set an example. Um, you know, I try to set an example on that stuff too, by just the way I conduct myself in the, in the stories and in the, and the other stuff as well. Right. I think that's, that's key. That's a good, yeah. a good key. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Derek. Cool. It was a pleasure having no, you. No, thanks for having me. It was great. Where can we find you online? Uh, at Derek Casio on okay. Instagram. And, and that's um, Casio with a C after the S. Yeah. C-A-S-C-I-O. Yes. Um, yes. Casio in Italian. Oh, Italian. okay. Um, but uh, yeah, at Derek Casio, um, fourthlawlabs.com. Check yeah. it out. Designmuseumfoundation.org. Uh, if you want to check out anything about the museum, they're doing some really awesome stuff. And um, ID, A-T, W-I-T, id at wit.com and you can check out some of the work that's been going on over there uh and some of our student work too um if you're looking for co-ops we've got a ton <laughs> awesome well yeah thanks again derek i mean you were such a great great interview and we needed we should get you back on to talk oh, some I'd love more to. about yeah that stuff. absolutely but uh as always i'm at nick p baker i'm at i draw receipts bye guys <laughs> see ya later <laughs>